Good morning, students. Our topic for today is about staining of bone marrow and blood. There are reasons why we need to do bone marrow aspiration and biopsy. Indications include diagnosis and monitoring of bone marrow and malignant hematologic disorders like acute and chronic leukemias, myelodysplastic syndromes, chronic myeloproliferative disorders, lymphomas, and plasma cell myeloma. Bone marrow aspiration and biopsy can also be done to diagnose cancers that spread into the bone marrow. It may also be performed to diagnose hemochromatosis or even fever of unknown origin or some infection. The body sites where we can do both bone marrow aspiration and core biopsy are posterior superior iliac crest, and it's the most commonly employed site for reason of safety and decreased risk of pain and accessibility. And of course, we can also do that in the anterior superior iliac crest. And this is an alternative site when the posterior iliac crest is unapproachable or not available due to infection, injury, or the patient is morbidly obese. There are also other sites that can be used if what is needed is only bone marrow aspirate, such as the sternum, which is the last resort for those older than 12 years old and generally avoided in babies. And it has disadvantages like more pain and it's too risky for heart injury. Another site is tibia, which can only be sampled for infants younger than one year old and we can also use spinous process of the vertebrae. Bone marrow preparations may either be bone marrow aspirate, bone marrow trephine or core biopsy or you may do both in the same setting. So let us discuss these one by one. Let's have an overview on how to do bone marrow aspirate. When the bone marrow aspiration needle is in place, use a 20 ml syringe to draw 1 ml of aspirate. Then place a few drops of aspirate on a slide held vertically to facilitate visualization of the bone marrow spicules as seen as granular particles on the side as shown in the picture on the right. Then using the edge of a second slide, separate and isolate a few bone marrow spicules from the rest of the sample. Then transfer these to a third slide and without applying pressure, distribute the spicules in the center of the slide. Then place the second slide across the third slide to form a cross with the spicules in the center. Then gently but quickly slide the second slide over the third slide to extend the spicules along its length. Then make sure that the aspirate is spread evenly over the entire slide. And of course, allow to dry, then fix and stain using standard methods for blood smear such as rites or gemsa stain. There are two types of bone marrow aspiration smear done. First is squash smear where the squash marrow particles with another slide as shown in figure A then pull to the end of the marrow slide as shown in figure B and you have two slides with squash smear as shown in figure C. This procedure however produced considerable artifact but it is still useful in the assessment of cellularity, megakaryocyte numbers, focal disease, and fibrotic marrows. And the second type of bone marrow smear is spread smear, where the marrow particles are placed at one end of the slide and spread with another slide like how a blood smear is done, as shown in figures A and B. Then you get the finished product as shown in figure C. This spread smear provides excellent detail of individual cell morphology. This is how squash smear looks like and this is how spread smear looks like. 
The picture on the left shows to you how squash smear looks like under the microscope and the picture on the right shows to you how spread smear looks like under the microscope. Notice that in the spread smear, you can appreciate the individual morphology of the cells. There are just some essential things to remember when doing bone marrow aspirate. Bone marrow smears should be prepared immediately following aspiration. Smears prepared from EDTA samples should be made as soon as possible to reduce storage artifact. Blood or bone marrow smear or touch prep should not be sprayed with or dipped in fixatives such as hairspray, alcohol, or formalin. Remember that Romanovsky stains used in hematology will only work on air-dried material that is relatively fresh and that is less than one month old. Unfixed and unstained aspirate smears stored at room temperature for long periods may give variable results on retrospective gem sustaining. And Aspirate slides fixed in absolute methanol may preserve DNA and possibly antigen for future fish or DNA extraction for PCR testing. And there should be a minimum of six smears and two particle squash or crush slides made, specifically two air dried smears and one squash slide fixed with fresh acetone free absolute methanol and stained with Romanovsky stain and a methanol fixed smear and squash slide stained with Prussian blue and counter stain with nuclear fast red. Bone marrow trephine or core biopsies perform either before or after the bone marrow aspirate. The trephine needle which has a hollow core is inserted into the sampling slide either directly or after making a small incision to facilitate access to the bone. The needle is pushed into the bone by rotating it on its axis, and when the desired depth is reached, the stylet is withdrawn and the needle is advanced using the same rotating movement. The depth of the needle is measured using a stylet, and a specimen measuring approximately 2 cm in length should be collected. Bone marrow trephine biopsy is useful in the assessment of overall marrow architecture and cellularity and provide greater sensitivity for the assessment of focal lesions and patchy infiltrates. So take a look at these photos. On the left is bone marrow aspirate while on the right is bone marrow trephine biopsy. Appreciate that in bone marrow aspirate you can appreciate the detailed morphology of individual cell. While in bone marrow trephine biopsy, as shown on the right, you can assess the bone marrow architecture and cellularity. So the recommended length of bone marrow trephine biopsy in adult is again at least 2 cm and the biopsy specimen shrinks by approximately 20% after processing. Also, touch imprint should be made from the trephine biopsy prior to placing in fixative. Imprints is especially important if there is a dry tap, meaning there's no bone marrow extracted during aspiration biopsy. This is done by gently touching the fresh unfixed core on the slide or the slide on the core, then fixed and stain similar to smear preparations. In order to protect the cellular and fibrous elements of bone from damage caused by the acids used as the calcifying agents, it is particularly important to thoroughly fix these specimens prior to decalcification. Because poorly fixed specimens become macerated during decalcification and stain poorly afterwards. Decalcification results to leaching out of some storage iron from the core biopsy. Decalcifying agent like nitric acid and hydrochloric acid diminish the acid fastness of mycobacteria resulting to false negative results and acid fastness is retained when decalcification is in formic acid, sodium citrate, or citric acid buffer. For bone marrow biopsies, zincer solution is recommended for fixing since this will decalcify tiny bony spicules which may have been admixed with the blood clot. This is done for 14 to 24 hours to decalcify the tiny bony spicules. Then, it is washed in running water for 3 to 6 hours and processed as for a bone marrow smear. 
It is then cleared, embedded in paraffin, and stained as required. The recommended thickness of section is actually 2 to 3 micra. So let us now discuss the stains used in bone marrow and blood. Much of the cytological details necessary for diagnosis of hematopoietic disorders can be obtained from marrow biopsies stained by hematoxylin and eosin technique, except for demonstration of iron and reticulin. The GEMSA stain may be helpful for identifying plasma cells, mast cells, lymphoid cells, eosinophils, and for distinguishing between myeloblast and proerythroblast. Another useful method involves staining of the granulopoietic precursor granules in glycol methacrylate sections using toluidine blue and eosin. Also remember that toluidine blue is the most useful and informative stain for plastic embedded tissue sections. Cytologic dysplasia, the morphologic hallmark of myelodysplastic syndromes, is best defined in bone marrow aspirate samples with may Grunewald gem sustain. Other stains that may be used to study myelodysplastic syndromes are HNE, GEMSA, Gomori Silver Impregnation Technique, and Pearl Stain in combination with Immunostaining. Reticulin stain, which generally uses silver, is particularly useful in the detection of myelofibrosis since reticulin is greatly increased in myelofibrosis. Trichrome stain is used to identify collagen fibrosis, which may also be recognized in well-stained HNE specimens. Romanovsky stains are neutral stains made up of oxidized methylene blue azor B and eosin Y dissolved in acetone-free methanol. Romanovsky staining works principally in its ability to produce a variety of use, which makes it possible to differentiate various cellular components. This ability is known as Romanowski effect or metachromasia. The azures are basic dyes that bind to the acid nuclei forming a blue-purple color, while the acid dye eosin binds to the alkaline cytoplasm forming red coloration. All Romanowski stains have a tendency to precipitate so that you need to filter it before using. And there are different types of Romanovsky stains, namely Jenner, Wright and Wright Gemsa, May Grunwald, and Lishman stains. And let us discuss these stains one by one. In Wright stain, methylene blue is polychromed by heating with sodium bicarbonate. It is a methanol based stain, so no need to undergo fixation step. The methanol itself acts as the fixative. Right stain is an empirical mixture of polychrome dyes, so one batch of right stain may be different from another batch of right stain. Stock solution can be stored and ripening or polychroming continues during storage. The solution should not be contaminated with water because if solution is contaminated with water, it results to poor staining quality. Right stain is the preferred staining method for bone marrow aspirate smears and it is advisable to keep a separate stock of right stain for bone marrow staining at least six months before use to allow it to ripen. In right stain, the erythrocytes appear yellowish red. Polymorphonuclear cell has dark purple nucleus, reddish lilac cytoplasmic granules, and pale pink cytoplasm. Eosinophil has blue nuclei red-orange-red granules, and blue cytoplasm. Basophil has purple to dark blue nucleus, but difficult to identify sometimes because the entire cell is covered by very dark purple granules. Lymphocyte has dark purple nuclei and sky blue cytoplasm. Monocyte has blue purple nucleus and grayish blue cytoplasm, and the platelets have violet to purple granules. Next is GEMSA stain which consists of methylene blue and eosin dissolved in methanol. The methanol itself acts as the fixative at the same time. Staining is usually performed at room temperature overnight and increasing the stain temperature shortens the staining time. 
And the differentiation is achieved using acetic acid. Acetic acid removes blue dye component, thus increasing the apparent intensity of the red component. GEMSA stain is a special stain used for examination of blood films for parasitic infections and primarily for the diagnosis of malaria just like what is shown in the photo on the right. It is also used as a differential stain for various blood cells and cellular components such as the nucleus and the cytoplasm. In GEMSA stain, microorganisms appear purplish blue as pointed by green arrows. Next stain that we need to discuss is right GEMSA or gender GEMSA stain. Important components include oxidized methylene blue and azure B which stain the nucleus varying shades of blue to purple and eosin Y which stains the cytoplasm of cells orange to pink. The results are nucleus which may be purple or blue, cytoplasm which may be pink or blue, and eosinophils which are pink or red. Next stain is may Grunewald gemsa stain which gives better results than Jenner gemsa. Differentiation can be achieved using phosphate buffer. The next stain is Pearl's Prussian Blue Iron Stain which is the gold standard in the detection of hemosiderin in bone marrow aspirate evaluating anemia, iron overload, and myelodysplasia. The recommended fixative if there is a plan for staining with Pearl's Prussian Blue is mercurial fixatives which preserves the iron in the bone marrow better than the formalin. In Pearl's Prussian Blue Iron Stain, dilute hydrochloric acid is used to release ferric ions from the binding proteins. Ferric ions then react with potassium ferrocyanide forming insoluble blue compound which is the Prussian blue reaction. Next stain is myeloperoxidase stain which is helpful in identifying cytoplasmic granules, characteristics of myeloid cells, differentiating myeloid leukemia from lymphoid leukemia. The recommended fixation in myeloperoxidase staining is 10% formalin. And the counter stain used in myeloperoxidase stain is GEMSA stain. The expected results in myeloperoxidase staining is myeloid cells except the basophils are positive giving us green to dark blue granules in the cytoplasm as shown in the photo on the right. And it is also said that eosinophils stained most intensely. Other cells like monocytes show slight peroxidase activity while basophils, lymphocytes, erythroblasts are negative. Mason's trichrome stain is used for undecalcified glycol methacrylate embedded bone marrow sections cut at 4 micra. It uses modified Weigert's iron hematoxylin and three different solutions labeled as solution A, also known as plasma stain, solution B, and solution C, also known as fiber stain. And the results of Mason's trichrome are dark gray nucleus, red osteoid, and blue collagen including mineralized bone. And that's the end of our lecture.